Today there are people who try to come to God through some other ways. They try to come to God by their own obedience. Some want God to accept them as they are without having to repent of their sins. When everything else fails, they assume there is a back door to heaven. Well, God is loving. He is gracious and merciful. Surely He will accept me. No, He won't. There is no other way. Sinners cannot come before a holy and just God only through a sacrifice. If they trust in Jesus, then the sacrifice has been made for their sins and they can come into God's presence by virtue of Christ's death and the shedding of His precious blood. When we have our sins forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. However, there is one sacrifice we will still need to make, and that is to offer ourselves to God. As Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In a sense, God does not command us to bring a sacrifice, but He wants us to become that sacrifice. He wants us to consecrate ourselves to Him. The problem with many people is that they do not want to give to God of themselves. They will give to God things. By that I mean they will give to God money, a certain amount of their time. They may be willing to be engaged in spiritual services or to volunteer for church work, but they will not give of themselves. Yet without ourselves, all these other gifts mean nothing to the Almighty God. God does not want your money, your time, your resources without yourself. You are the one for whom Jesus died. You are the one He loves. So when the Bible speaks of the living sacrifice, the reasonable service, it means you are the one God wants. Our text for tonight's message is taken from Exodus chapter 27, verse 1 to 19. So far, we have considered the construction of the tabernacle and all the furniture that went into the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place to worship God, to enter His presence, and to behold His glory. It was the place where the people would meet the God of heaven, Therefore, specific instructions were given on how the tabernacle was to be built to communicate God's perfect holiness as well as His covenant love for His people. As mentioned previously, the only way the people could come before the Almighty God was through the offering of an animal sacrifice signifying their sins had been atoned for. Therefore, this is where the author comes into the picture. And the author was situated in the courtyard. So this passage is about the author and the courtyard. Some people find it very tedious to study the construction of the tabernacle and all the furniture inside and outside with all the measurements rather than being bogged down by all the details we want to understand the spiritual significance of those things and what they mean to us the title of our message is a day in thy court is better than a thousand this title is taken from Psalm 84, verse 10. Two things we want to learn from this message, the description and the significance. From verses 1 to 8, 
The Bible speaks about the author for making sacrifices. The author was the largest piece of furniture at the tabernacle, measuring about seven feet long, seven feet wide, and four feet high. It was constructed in the shape of a square with horns at each of the four corners. In the ancient world, the horn was a symbol of strength and power. And since the author was used for offering sacrifices, it had to do with salvation. As the psalmist David said in Psalm 18 verse 2, the Lord is the horn of my salvation. Later on, the people would hold on to the horns of the author for safety or security. When the accused criminals were being pursued by their adversaries, sometimes they would run to the author and cling onto the horns for protection. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50 to 51, as well as chapter 2, verse 28. The author was made of wood, overlaid with brass or bronze, which was a combination of copper and tin. Why was bronze being used? There were practical reasons for this. Bronze was more durable and heat resistant than most metals. So it was the right material to be used for the author. But most likely, there was also a spiritual meaning. Up to this point, notice, all the furnishings inside the tabernacle were made of gold, but the altar outside the tabernacle was made of bronze. The inside of the tabernacle, especially the Holy of Holies, represented the place where God was. So it was only fitting that his throne was surrounded with splendor. Therefore, the ark, the table of showbread, and the lampstand were all golden. Even the feet things inside the innermost part of the tabernacle were made of gold. Interestingly, everything inside the tabernacle was made of gold. And the surrounding, the pedestals, the sockets, that held up the poles for the tents were made of silver. And then in the courtyard, outside the tabernacle, where the altar was placed, everything was made of bronze. One theologian made this interesting observation, which I thought was very meaningful. He said, the closer the people were to God, the more precious the metal. Beginning with bronze, then silver, and finally gold that was fit for the king of kings. That is a wonderful way to look at the different precious metals being used in the tabernacle. The altar was outside in the courtyard. It was made of bronze, and so were the utensils. There were pans and shovels for removing the ashes from the altar. There were basins for collecting and sprinkling the blood of the animals. There were long forks for turning the meat over the flame which the people and the priests were allowed to eat. There were fire pans for collecting live coals when the tabernacle had to be transported from place to place. They were all made 
of bronze. Around the halfway mark of the altar, there was a net covering also made of bronze. Some theologians believe that this was supposed to allow air to flow from underneath as the sacrifice was burned over the flames above. It also allowed the fat of the animal to drip down. Just like everything else in the tabernacle, the altar was designed to be portable. So it came with carrying poles made of wood and overlaid with bronze. The altar itself was hollow, which means the four sides were solid, but there was nothing inside except the net covering. Then from the author, God moved on to speak about the courtyard where the author would be placed from verses 9 to 19. The tabernacle itself was surrounded by a fence which marked the boundaries. It measured about 75 feet by 150 feet, a total area of more than 10,000 square feet. By way of comparison, it would be the size of four tennis courts. The tabernacle itself took up about 1,000 square feet. The rest of the 9,000 square feet was the courtyard. There were 60 pillars resting on 60 sockets and they were joined by white linen curtains. The fence was about eight feet tall, which means from the outside, the children of Israel could see the top of the tabernacle and the smoke rising up from the altar. But they could not see the things happening inside the tabernacle. There was an entrance for the courtyard and it was made with the same material as the inside of the tabernacle, white linen of blue, purple, and scarlet. Some scholars have tried to determine the meaning of the four colors, white, blue, purple, and scarlet. Some say they signify the four gospels. Others say, they represent the saving work of Jesus Christ. Blue represents his heavenly origin. Purple represents his kingship. Scarlet represents his sacrificial death. And white represents his sinless perfection. But the Bible does not say what those colors were supposed to symbolize. So all these suggestions were but speculations. The same principle applies to the huge entrance, which was about 30 feet wide. Again, some people say that the huge entrance was a symbol of God's mercy that he welcomed the people to come into his grace. But when you consider the number of people entering the courtyard and then bringing the number of animals as they came along, the width of the entrance was more of a practical necessity than a lesson in theology. If you consider the tabernacle and the courtyard, you will notice there were three main sections. The courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. Remember there was a similar situation back at Mount Sinai. Only Moses was allowed to go up the mountain and meet with God. He was the mediator 
the man who represented God before the people and the people before God. The elders could approach God and even commune with him, but they could only go halfway up. Then down at the bottom of the mountain were the rest of the people who were not allowed to go up at all. They had to stay at a distance. The tabernacle was constructed in a similar way. Only the high priest could enter the most holy place. He was the mediator, the man who represented God before the people and the people before God. The rest of the priests were allowed to go halfway. They could enter the holy place, but not the most holy place. The rest of the people were kept outside. They could enter the courtyard, but not the tabernacle itself. Perhaps one more group of people ought to be mentioned. The Gentiles were not allowed to enter at all. Later on, in Leviticus 22, verse 18 to 19, they could enter if they had come to faith in the God of Israel and received the sign of circumcision. When King Solomon replaced the tabernacle with the temple at Jerusalem, there were two courtyards, an outer courtyard and an inner courtyard. The temple during King Herod's time had four courts. Only the priests were allowed to enter the innermost court. Outside was the court of the men of Israel, followed by the court for the women of Israel. And finally, the outermost court court was for the Gentiles. God never mentioned anything about keeping the women out. The division between the tabernacle and the courtyard was intended to teach the children of Israel that they were separated from the holy presence of God because of their sins. That was one of the reasons Jesus came and he died. He did his saving work by his death and resurrection. Our Lord Jesus, he separated the dividing veil that kept sinners from entering the most holy place. Jesus opened the way to God. But Jesus did not only tear down the dividing veil between God and men. He also tore down the dividing wall that separated the Jews and the Gentiles. That was why Galatians 3 verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither born nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Dear friend, contrary to what the world thinks of Christianity, that it is a white man's religion, any sinner, regardless of race, nationality, culture, or gender, whether male or female, they can come by faith through Jesus Christ to God himself. Do you realize that today, Southeast Asia, is the fastest 
or has the fastest growing number of Christians in the world. With China having the most numbers, about 44 million Christians. Praise be to God that he has also brought you and me to salvation through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So much for the description of the author and the courtyard. Let us move on to consider the significance and what it means to us. In those days, when the children of Israel went to the tabernacle, the first step was to walk through the entrance into the courtyard. It was a busy place, full of people, priests and animals. And immediately they were confronted with the biggest piece of furniture at the tabernacle, the brazen altar. They knew that they could not come before a holy God because of their sins. And that was the purpose of the author, for them to offer sacrifices. What lessons can we learn from here? Today there are people who try to come to God through some other ways. They try to come to God by their own obedience or by making themselves good enough for God or through some charitable works they have done. Some want God to accept them as they are without having to repent of their sins. When everything else fails, they assume there is a back door to heaven. Well, God is loving. He is gracious and merciful. Surely he will accept me. No, he won't. There is no other way. Sinners cannot come before a holy and just God. Only through a sacrifice. If they trust in Jesus, then the sacrifice has been made for their sins and they can come into God's presence by virtue of Christ's death and the shedding of his precious blood. There is no other way. Only through the sacrifice of our Lord and Saviour. There was only one author for the entire nation of Israel. And it was constantly being used. There were four main types of sacrifices, according to the book of Leviticus. There was the burnt offering, which was a general sacrifice for sin. And it represented a complete surrender, a total consecration to God. There was the grain offering, which was about the harvest. Part of the harvest was dedicated to God with thanksgiving for all the blessings he has showered upon their lives. There was the fellowship offering, where part of the animal was sacrificed to God and the rest were eaten by the worshippers, signifying their reconciliation with God. Then there was the sin offering and guilt offering, where the sin of an individual or the sin of the entire nation was atoned for. So there were different sacrifices being offered. The book of Exodus was written about 1,400 years before Jesus Christ. And the temple was destroyed in AD 70, whereby the sacrificial system stopped because there was no more temple to make sacrifices. 
So for the next 1,000 years over, can you imagine the number of animals being sacrificed? Thousands and thousands of bulls, goats, lambs, pigeons were being offered. But it was still not enough. The people were always committing more sins. And there were always more sacrifices to make. That was why Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. All the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to the one ultimate sacrifice that would take place. When Jesus Christ offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to atone for sin forever, Jesus did not make his sacrifice on the brazen altar in the tabernacle. He did it by dying and shedding his precious blood on the cross of Calvary. Maybe you can turn with me to Hebrews 9 verse 24 to 26. Hebrews 9 verse 24 to 26, allow me to read for you. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. But then must he often have suffered, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Today, when you and I approach God, we come by way of the cross. Jesus is the only author and sacrifice we need. As we used to sing, Jesus paid it all. When we have our sins forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. However, there is one sacrifice we will still need to make. And that is to offer ourselves to God. As Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In a sense, God does not command us to bring a sacrifice. But he wants us to become that sacrifice. He wants us to consecrate ourselves to him. The problem with many people is that they do not want to give to God of themselves. They will give to God things. By that I mean they will give to God money even though they may not be as generous as they seem to be. They may be willing to give a certain amount of their time. They may be willing to be engaged in spiritual services or to volunteer for church work, but they will not give of themselves. Yet without ourselves, all these other gifts mean nothing to the Almighty God. God does not want your money, your time, your resources without yourself. 
You are the one for whom Jesus died. You are the one he loves. So when the Bible speaks of the living sacrifice, the reasonable service, it means you are the one God wants. It is so sad that people try to substitute things for themselves. What God wants is for us to totally surrender and completely consecrate ourselves to Him. And that is a most reasonable service. Perhaps one more lesson we can learn from this passage is that the children of Israel loved to go into the courtyard of the tabernacle. How do we know? There were numerous times when they sang with great joy as they entered into the courtyard and offered their sacrifices. Allow me to quote just one example from Psalm 84. Maybe you can turn with me as we conclude. Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God, then look down to verse 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So each time when the children of Israel came into the courtyard and offered their sacrifices, whether it be the burnt offering, the grain offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, or the guilt offering, they came with great joy. They knew in their hearts that it was better to be with God in the courtyard, even just standing in the doorway, than to be out there in the world. Dear friend, is this the attitude of our hearts every time we come to church? Though we no longer bring those offerings like the children of Israel, but those spiritual elements are still represented in our worship each time we come. Is it not true? In the Holy Communion, we are reminded of how we are reconciled to God through the blood and death of Jesus Christ. In our prayer, we commune with God and ask of Him to forgive us of our sins. In our tithes and offerings, we give thanks to God for His bountiful blessings that He has showered upon our lives. In our services, we consecrate ourselves to serve the one living and true God. There are many things in life that will fight for our attention and take our eyes away from the worship of God. It could be extra money that you can earn if you work on Sundays. It could be entertainment or the pleasures of life. It could be friends coming from overseas and you want to attend to them or even non-tangible things like bitterness, anger, unhappiness, 
laziness or inconveniences. The question is, will anything be able to keep us from worshipping God? Or will we be able to say, no, nothing. It is better for me to be in the church, in the house of God, even if it is only for one day. It is better than a thousand days away from God. Even if it is only standing in the doorway or be the doorkeeper of the church, we would rather be here than elsewhere in the world. Will you be able to say that? For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thee thanks for how, as we consider this portion of scriptures, as we learn of all the specific instructions given in the construction of the author which was placed in the courtyard, whereby the people entered into the courtyard to make sacrifices. We learn spiritual lessons that we may apply into our lives. Today, we who have been forgiven of our sins by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, though we no longer need to bring sacrifices unto thee, but there is still one sacrifice we need to make, and that is to offer ourselves as living sacrifices unto thee, as thou hast commanded us in thy word. We want to totally consecrate and surrender ourselves unto thee, we want to serve Thee with all our hearts, minds, and strength. And even as we come for worship, may our hearts rejoice, just as the people of old, as they entered into the courtyard. They sang with great joy, for it is better to be in Thy courts than a thousand days. O oh Lord, we want to have this attitude as we come for worship. So as we come for worship, we consider all the spiritual elements of our worship. As we are reminded in our Holy Communion, we are reconciled to thee through the death and blood of Jesus Christ. In our prayers, we commune with thee and give thee thanks and also ask of thee to forgive us. In our tithes and offerings, we come with thanksgiving. Indeed, thou hast blessed us so abundantly. How can we not give thanks? And in our services, we are reminded that we ought to consecrate ourselves as we serve the one living and true God. O Lord, may thou continue to teach us and remind us, and may the Spirit of God work in our hearts in such a way that all of us will have this attitude of the psalmist. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Paul Cheng, pastor of Bethel Bible Presbyterian Church. Hopefully you found this sermon helpful. If so, have a think over today's reflection question. And if you'd like, feel free to share your answer with us in the comments below. We'd love to know your thoughts on the matter and about how today's message has touched you. Thank you for taking your time to join us here today.